What I'm going to do is talk to you today about, about the DSF family of uh, bacterial cell cell signal molecules. Probably these are molecules that you're probably less familiar with than the homocene lactons about which we've heard. But I have to say that uh, Subhut Heap has also talked about this yesterday, although I wasn't able to be here for his talk. And so he'll have introduced some of the elements of what I'm going to talk about today in his talk. Okay, so what I, the way I'm going to go about this, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the discovery of this signaling system in Xanthomonas. Uh, uh, and then and, and the, the role that the RPF proteins have in generating the signal and also in signal perception. I'll then talk a little bit about DSF signaling more widely in the Xanthomonads rather than Xanthomonas campestris. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I know the Subadeep will talk about this later on. I know that Steve um, uh, Lindau will also talk about Xylella. I'll talk a little bit about Stenotrophomonas. But really what I want to go on the end of it is to try to extend the idea that this, these signaling systems or signaling systems involving this class of signal molecule are actually more broadly distributed in bacteria than just in Xanthomonas. And I'll talk a little bit about intraspecies signaling in Burkholderia sinusopatia and in other Burkholderia species, and interspecies signaling involving these organisms in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, so as we know, and I shouldn't really need to put this up, these bacterial cell cell signaling molecules are structurally diverse. And the structure that defines what we would regard as the DSF family is they are cis unsaturated fatty acids. So, this structure here of a cis 2 unsaturated fatty acid is the motif that, that defines the structure of this class of molecules. And this was the first one of these molecules that were described. Uh, it was actually the structure was determined by the, the Luan He Zhang lab in Singapore. It's called DSF for diffusible <laughs> signal factor and it's cis 11 methyl 2 dodecinoic acid. They showed by using a number of analogues and synthetic chemistry that this, this structure is actually required for the activity. Okay, so basically, so our story essentially starts in Xanthomonas campestris, which is, uh, as, as we know, uh, an organism which causes the black rot of crucifers. It kills many crucifers, Arabidopsis, turnips, and Brussels sprouts, thankfully. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, 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 and this is the, the nature of the disease. It's called black rot. It's a vascular pathogen. It enters the leaves through hydrothodes at the leaf surface, and then it, it, it grows into the, in the vascular system, causing these chlorotic lesions within which are these necrotic uh, veins which are which are black and that's what gives the disease its characteristic name so it's not a soft rot but it causes this rotting disease it's also quite important because it produces this compound called xanthan which is a component that's used as a food additive it's all used in the oil recovery industry and as with many others here we have now have the, the the capacity to do genomics because we have complete genome sequences of a number of strains of xanthomonas campestris pathovar campestris the first one was done in Brazil, then there was a, a, a Chinese one uh, done uh, in, the, in the Tang lab in, uh, in Nanning, and then f uh, uh, from Alf Puhler's lab in Germany. Okay, so in our, in our original studies of Xanthomonas campestris, we were trying to discover genes and gene products that were required for the ability of this organism to cause the symptoms that I've described. And, we did, and in our lab, in Mike Daniel's lab, we discovered that this extracellular polysaccharide xanthan and the synthesis of extracellular enzymes that degrade plant cell wall components, such as protease and endoglucanase, are actually important to get full disease symptoms. Now, more importantly, uh, in Mike's lab, it was discovered that the synthesis of these components is regulated by a gene cluster that we called RPF, for regulation of pathogenicity factors. And this, this regulates the synthesis, positively regulates the synthesis of these components, the enzymes, the polysaccharide. It also regulates other components, I'll talk a bit more about this tomorrow, biofilm dispersal, and is required for pathogenicity. And the, 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 the important thing for this talk is that several of these RPF proteins are believed to act in a signal uh, system, a signal cell cell signaling system that involves a diffusible factor that we call DSF for diffusible signal factor. Now, these, this is the, these are the RPF genes that are, that are the central to this cell cell signaling system. We have RPFB and RPFF. RPFB is a long chain uh, fatty acyl CoA ligase, and RPFF has some homology, some homology to enal CoA hydratases. So they're both fatty acid hending enzymes. The synthesis of this diffusible factor is dependent, entirely dependent on RPFF and partially dependent upon RPFB. 
Over here, and transcribed as an operon, in the opposite direction, we have RPF, G, H, and C. And these actually encode components of a two-component system that we believe senses the DSF signal as involved in signal transduction. As we'll see, RPFC encodes a complex sensor kinase, it's a hybrid sensor kinase, and RPFG is a response regulator, which instead of being a DNA binding protein, is an enzyme that regulates the cellular level of the second messenger cyclic digMP. Again, uh, the, this, this is the structure of DSF, again, just to acknowledge that this was published in 2004. Okay, so as I said, RPFF is absolutely required for DSF synthesis and has some homology to enal-CoA hydratase. Though, because there are many enal-CoA hydratases in organisms, it's sometimes you can't find homologs in many organisms. RPFC is a complex sensor kinase with five predicted transmembrane helices. I'll show you a cartoon of that in a minute. It has a histidine kinase uh, domain, a receiver domain in this fused thing, and a C-terminal HPT domain. So it's a complex sensor kinase. And RPFG is a regulatory protein that has an HDGYP domain, which is involved in degrading cyclic DIGMP. And I'll talk, as I said, I'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow. And this is how we imagine this system works then, just as a cartoon to summarise what I've said. RPFF makes DSF, which we think is freely diffusible out of the cell. We believe that DSF is recognised by these transmembrane domain of RPFC. It, we think it leads to uh, autophosphorylation of RPFC, phosphorelay through the receiver domain, an HPT domain, to the receiver domain of RPFG, which then activates RPFG as an enzyme to degrade cyclic DIGMP. And then downstream of this, there are a whole range of different functions which are regulated by cyclic DIGMP in the cell. And, uh, and as I say, I'll talk about those tomorrow. Is that a key Y-like domain? This is, yes, yeah, yeah. So this is a key Y-like and this one is as well, yeah. Okay. Now, cyclic DIGMP is known to regulate a range of functions in bacteria. There's been an explosion of interest in this. It was originally described to be involved in the regulation of cellulose synthesis way back in 1987. Uh, this, this observation, the importance of this wasn't recognized until probably in the 21st century when, when it was now, when, when people started to actually look at biofilm formation in organisms and then also sequencing many, many genomes. And it was clear that the, 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 the genes that were involved in making this molecule in uh, Acetobacter were widely distributed or homologs were widely distributed and they were involved in biofilm formation and aggregation. It's now known to do a lot of other things including the synthesis of virulence factors and the virulence of human, animal and plant pathogens. Okay now, so um, I can just skip by that one for a minute. So basically, the, the, I'm not going to talk anything more about cyclic DIGMP today. I'll talk about that tomorrow. What I want to talk about is how we, you know, found out more about the DSF signaling system, not only in Xanthomonas campestris, Pathobar campestris, but in other Xanthomonas and in other organisms. Now, in order to do this, of course, the first thing we, we did was to try to devise a, a bioassay, and this is obviously important. It's a basic tenet of all this type of experiment. And the bioassay that we, we originally devised was one where we took uh, a mutant in the RPFF gene. So the RPFF mutant cannot make the signal molecule DSF. And the phenotype of an RPFF mutant is it has much lower levels of endoglucanase than the wild type. The idea would be then that if you added DSF, either synthetic DSF, or extracts from an organic solvent from a culture supernatant to that strain, you could then restore endoglucanase activity, giving you a, a measure of the DSF activity, okay, with all the caveats associated with that type of experiment. And that's how we did this originally. And then we devised another assay where rather than using the, the enzyme activity we, to measure, what we did was we fused the promoter of the endoglucanase gene to uh, GUS, and other laboratories, Steve Lindau's have used GFP, and then did exactly the same experiment. So what you can do then is have a plate where you have, uh, where you actually measure GUS with x gluc and here we see a plate which contains the reporter strain and the RPFF mutant carrying the endoglucanase GUS reporter. And on that we've, we've pin inoculated several different strains of Xanthomonas campestris, different mutants, and we can see that these large blue zones indicate the level of DSF production. Unfortunately, this is the wild type and this is the RPFC mutant. Again, a, a topic I'll come back to later on. So we have a bioassay for this molecule. We can sort of <laughs> 
<laughs> tromp around the microbial world looking for this molecule in different organisms. And of course, with the explosion of genetic and genomic information, we can also look for this, the, 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 this signaling system or the presence of signaling components in other organisms as well. Okay, now, and not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, both this, this kind of assay a physical assay for the presence of the, of, the, of the signal molecule, but also many genomic assays indicate that in general, the RPF cluster is, is generally conserved or it's conserved in all xanthomonas, in all xanthomonas species and all xanthomonas, including xylella. And in many of these organisms, if you make mutations in the elements of the system, most labs make mutations in RPFF, it will reduce the ability of the organisms to cause disease on the hosts. Now, one of the obvious uh, exceptions to this is xylella, and again, there are some uh, special uh, uh, differences between xylella and xanthomonas that I don't want to touch on. But nevertheless, the RPF system in, uh, in, is present, certainly RPF, F, G, and C are present in most, in all xanthomonads, and in ones that have been tested, the system seems to contribute <coughs> to, to virulence. And here we see compa some comparative genomics of the RPF clusters in, in a range of different species. In some of them, this RPFH gene is, 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 is missing. We simply can't find a phenotype for that, but we can see the conservation of all the other elements. Now, beyond the pathogenic xanthomonads, the ones like of the xanthomonas and xylella uh, 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 genera, we have this other organism called stenotrophomonas. And this is actually a very versatile and adaptable organism. It is a nosocomial uh, pathogen. It causes hospital-inquired infections. It's also used in bioremediation and phytoremediation because it is able to grow, or some strains are able to grow endophytically in the roots of plants and it can be used in, in remediation. It has biocontrol and plant growth promotion properties and also it's involved in the production of important secondary metabolites and we were able to show that it also can kill nematodes. So, and again, uh, we were able to show that, or look in the genome sequence of this organism, this S multifilia, this is a, a K279A, which is a clinical isolate, has an RPF gene cluster, which is very similar to that in X campestris. Here we see that the RPFH gene is missing. RPFC is, slight, is a slightly larger gene, but all the other elements are there. We were able to show that S multifilia produced the DSF signal molecule as assayed by our xanthomonas assay. And when we knocked out the elements of the cluster, let's say in the RPFF mutant, we saw a range of phenotypes, the sort of phenotypes that we can see in Xanthomonas campestris. A lack of motility, a reduction in protease production. This is a protease, a serine protease that may contribute to the virulence of this organism. A change in the LPS profile. And then an aggregated behavior when grown in flasks. If we look at the ability of this strain to cause to kill nematodes, we can see that the strain is, is, has a very low ability to kill nematodes compared with the wild type. So in, in, in Stenotroph monas, which is related to Xanthomonas and Xylella, the RPF system seems to exist. It seems to control many functions that may contribute to the ability of this to be a pathogen, perhaps in humans, and also perhaps other, other functions that we haven't yet uh, described that may contribute to its ability to be an endophyte and so on and so forth. Now, okay, so that's basically the background. So let's go on to what, we were, what I want to talk about most today. First, the first of all is, is trying to extend the realm of this beyond the xanthomonad species. When we started working on this, it was clear that when you, when you looked, at, looked at reviews of, home, uh, of quorum sensing, you had homocene lactones and then AI2. And then at the back, you know, with, when all the other things, there was DSF signal, you know, it's, uh, other molecules have been described in Xanthomonas campestris. Oh yeah, well, you know, so, and we're always at the back, you know, <laughs> at the end after the quorum sensing with homocene lactone guys had had their say. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. <laughs> okay, first of all, the first thing we did, as I said, and basically, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, based on this genomic, in fact, I got carried away, I, we almost had it there. Um, right, based on this genomic information, we look for the RPF gene cluster in other organisms that were unrelated to Xanthomonas species. So we might, and, and, and bizarrely, we actually found that the full RPF F, G, and C in the same orientations with respect to each other in Thiobacillus dinitrificans, Methylobacillus flagellatus, and Sideroxidans lithotrophicus. And all I can say is thank God for Wikipedia because I've never ever heard of this. <laughs> okay, now, second thing 
is that, remember that I told you that the RPFC is a sensor kinase that recognizes DSF. Now, if you blast genome sequences with RPFC, what you tend to find is you won't find uh, full homologs, but what, you do, what we did, what well, a smart thing we did was to just blast with the, with the, with the sensor domain. In other words, do a blast P search with the sensor domain, looking for other proteins in other bacteria that may have a sensor domain that was related to the sensor domain of RPFC. Not imagining that they would be histidine kinases, they could be other sorts of signaling protein. And again, we found sensor domains related to that in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, pathobars of Pseudomonas syringi, Pseudomonas fluorescens. This thiobacillus is actually the same thing as up here, and also paracoccus. So this w was a clue that perhaps, um, and it was introduced, the idea of eavesdropping, that perhaps some of these organisms, which were not known to produce DSF family signals, could perhaps uh, sense them, and I'll talk a little bit to that later on. And then, really, a major step in extending DSF signaling beyond the xanthomonas was, in fact, the discovery of related molecules in unrelated bacteria. And again, the work of the Zhang lab is seminal in this. A, a discovery in 2008 that Burkholderia sinocepacea, uh, it's a cystic fibrosis strain, produced a molecule that they call BDSF. I don't know whether that's Burkholderia DSF or the second DSF, but I think it's Burkholderia DSF. Again, a report from, from a laboratory in the United States, uh, uh, is it David Davis, called, showed that Pseudomonas aeruginosa produced not uh, uh, cis desinoic acid, a molecule that doesn't come up in the DSF bioassay in Xanthomonas, but is apparently present and, and, and is involved in biofilm dispersal. And then another group, and I'll just talk about this at the end, uh, in Streptococcus, a gram-positive organism now, produced a molecule that they called SDSF. So it's beginning to get sort of uh, probably uh, Streptococcus DSF. And I'll just talk a little bit about this later on. Again, this is a molecule which is, affects um, um, a, a biofil or yeast hyphal transition in candida, an issue I'll talk, talk about later on, but is not known to be a signal molecule yet in Streptococcus. And I'll talk a bit about that later. Okay, so what I'm gonna do basically is talk about these last two topics here in some detail. So the first thing is to compare, the, uh, the, this is RPFC in this, in this smart diagram. We see this is the, these are these five transmembrane helices, histidine kinase, receiver, and HPT domain. Now, if we look at PA1396, this is the thing that we found when we looked at the blast search with this sequence here. So it's got five transmembrane helices. Remember, the blast search is based upon a linear amino acid sequence, not necessarily hydrophobicity or anything like that. It has it's, it is a histidine kinase. It has a receiver domain, but no HPT domain. So this is in our eyes, was a putative sensor for DSF in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, an organism at the time that we didn't believe made any form of DSF signal. Now, so, and, and what we did was, basically, what this says here is, we what we wanted to try and find out was, was, would this organism respond to DSF? And we're too tight in, in Ireland to do transcriptome profiling, just throwing DSF at things and see what happens. So we had to think of a, of a, of a, of a cheaper way of doing this. And so what we thought we'd do is try to use an organism that generates DSF, stenotrophin or multifilia, together with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They're both nosocomal pathogens, they both occur in, in, in the cystic fibrosis lung together, and they also probably occur in other environments together, both in humans and also in the, in the wider plant environment, for example. So what we, what we did was we, we wanted to find out whether interactions occurred between these two organisms, and whether these interactions depended upon interspecies signaling. So we know that I've told you that Stenotrophomonas produces DSF. It also produces a range of structure-related molecules, and this was, again, from Amy Wong's lab showed that back in 2007. Uh, we knew that this PA1396 gene, or gene product, was in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the two organisms together, and we're going to ask whether interactions occur. And the way we did this, this might seem a little bizarre, was to actually uh, grow them together in a biofilm, in a flow cell and look for interactions between them. So what we're going to try to do, and what the next few slides are going to show, is these organisms grown individually, grown together, and then grown together where we've knocked out the RPF gene in Stenotroph monas, and also when we've knocked out PA1396, the, the gene that we think senses the ESA in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So I'm, I apologize for anybody who's colorblind. Um, uh, this, is, this is bright purple. 
Uh, uh, right. Okay. So the, what we see in in this particular medium is that that, that we have we, we don't get the we, in this media we do these experiments we don't get these mushroom structures that people see in other media. That's not because of the strain is different. It's simply because of the medium that we grow it in. So in this biofilm we see this structure here covering the surface, and this is K two seven nine eight. It forms these kind of filaments in the biofilm. This is the RPFF mutant of, of K2798, so this is knocked out in the DSF signaling system. We can see that there's a difference in the structure here, I'm led to believe, between this and this. There are less filaments, the biofilm has a different shape and the biomass is slightly different. If we add DSF back to this strain, we get a phenotype that looks very similar to this. So, as with all of these things, if you add DSF exogenously to an RPFF mutant, in many cases, you can we can restore the wild-type phenotype, suggesting that this, that this extracellular signal is responsible for these, for these actions. Okay, now, so what happens when we put them together? Now, this is a very, very confusing. Uh, here we see PA01 and K279A together. This has got this filament, this is growing, it's a mat here. But when you look at them together, it looks like um, we've got two interwoven strands of different colours. And this is because we believe in this case that the, the presence of K279A is making PAO1 grow in a filamentous fashion. Okay? It's not growing like this, it's growing in a filamentous fashion. If we knock out the RPFF gene in Stenotroph monas, then the, this interaction doesn't occur in the same way. What we see instead is, is rather that the multifilia seems to grow on top of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We don't see the level of interaction that we see here. If we add DSF to PAO1, it starts to be this filament that look a little bit like what we see here. You can see that that is not the same as this. And if we complement our RPFF mutant with uh, the gene, we can see we re return to this case here. So, right, and then this shows us the next, next thing is what we're looking at in this. So, Basically, just to summarize the last thing, we seem to see some sort of interaction between the two organisms. We don't know what that means, but we can see that there's a change in biofilm formation of Pseudomonas aeruginosa when grown with Stenotroph monas. This change does not occur when we knock out the RPFF gene in Stenotroph monas, suggesting that the production of the DSF signal is required. If we add DSF, purified DSF, to Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we get these filaments produced even in the absence of Stenotroph monas. And what these uh, images tell you is that this effect of DSF on Pseudomonas aeruginosa depends upon PA1396 because you don't see it in a PA1396 mutant. Okay, and I, I don't want to go through this, but essentially that's that, that's the thing. This is already published anyway. Okay, now so that gives us some clue that Pseudomonas aeruginosa can recognise DSF. And this recognition depends upon PA1396. Now, to try to prove that, what we did is, uh, and Steve uh, alluded to this earlier on, was domain swapping experiments, where what we've got is, this is RPFC, and this is PA1396. And what we've done is, we've just taken this part of PA1396 and swapped it for the same part of RPFC to make this chimeric PA1396 RPFC protein. Now, what we're going to do is put that back in our favourite organism, Xanthomonas, in an RPFCF double mutant. So this is not going to be able to make DSF, so we're going to add DSF exogenously. And we're going to see whether this chimeric protein can sense the signal that we add to activate the synthesis of the components like endoglucanase and protease that we know are regulated normally by DSF in Xanthomonas campestris. And we, we were able to show this was the case, and we used this system to look at the effects of DSF and then farnesoic acid, which is believed to, which is a molecule produced by candida, which has uh, 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 an unsaturated bonds in it. We also used the trans version of DSF. You notice, see this, the, the orientation of this carboxyl group with respect to the, uh, and this bond here. This is a trans structure rather than, a cis, rather than the cis structure. And we used decanoic acid. And of all these, this DSF was actually effectively recognized by this chimeric sensor protein, suggesting that the input domain of PA1396, as we believe the input domain of RPFC, is involved in directly recognizing the signal. We don't know exactly how that occurs uh, as yet. Okay, now, and then we also were able to show, uh, and this is just, we, we did some, we did some um, proteomics on this to try to find out what was going on. And we were able to show that, that one of the consequences of this recognition between these two organisms was an alteration in the resistance of Pseudomonas aeruginosa to polymyxins. 
cationic antimicrobial peptides. And we can see that the poly that, uh, uh, mutation of PA1396 or addition of DSF gives an increased tolerance to polymyxins. That's okay. So we see some changes. And we've actually mapped more of these changes now by transcriptional profiling. Okay, so just to, just to summarize this bit, DSF appears to be involved in interspecies signaling of S. multifilia with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. DSF perception, we think, involves a sensor kinase P1396. And the consequences of this perception are altered biofilm architecture and altered expression of stress and virulence related proteins. Great. Now, the thing is that for Stenotroph monas and Pseudomonas aeruginosa here, you can also read Xanthomonas campestris and Pseudomonas syringi because Pseudomonas syringi has a homologue of PA1396. Xanthomonas campestris obviously produces DSF, and we can see the same type of interactions between these organisms as we see between these, between these clinically relevant organisms. So it may well be that this type of interspecies signaling involving DSF is more widely distributed and is actually relevant to plant microbe interactions, let's say on leaf surfaces or something like this. Now, and on to the last uh, section now, moving on. Oh, I've, I've talk, oh, no, it's only half an hour, sorry. Sorry, keep doing that. Um, right, okay, now, the thing is, that uh, uh, the, the other thing that actually expanded our understanding or, of, the, of, the, of the breadth of the, 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 the uh, DSF signaling molecules in uh, the microbial world was this discovery in 2008, again, by the Zhang lab in Singapore, when they showed that Burkholderia sinocipacea, this is J2315, this is a cystic fibrosis isolate, produced a molecule that they call BDSF. And this is, uh, again, Burkholderia DSF. And this lacks this one methyl group here. So it's exactly the same as DSF, but it just lacks the methyl group. Now, here's an important difference now, that when they actually tracked down the, the gene that was involved in making the DS, BDSF in this organism, here we have, they've called it RPFF. This is B, BCAM0581. You can see that this gene is in a completely different genomic context from RPFF in the RPF gene cluster of xanthomonads. So uh, it's flanked by genes which are not related to RPFC or RPFB. There's no, uh, 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 and in fact, there's no, we can't find an RPFC homologue in this organism. So this is, this is a, a very unexpected finding to have this type of signal produced uh, in, a, in, a, in a completely different environment. But it raises the question, of course, is, is this signal, and, and basically in the Zhang lab, they concentrated on the fact that this signal molecule was able, or this molecule rather, was able to actually affect the yeast hyphal transition in Candida albicans. And so they touted this as an interkingdom signal. It will work in, to affect yeast hyphal transition in Candida. And I have to say that many other uh, molecules of a similar nature will also do the same thing, including some homocene lactones. And this, this is a paper that came out in 2008. So what we did was basically go back and look at this and see whether this molecule also acted as an interspecies signal in Burkholderia. In other words, making mutations in RPFF and seeing whether we got phenotypes or not. And indeed, we did. And also, uh, there's a, there was a couple of pub uh, publication from our lab and then also from, from the Zhang lab showing that, that the BDSF signaling, in other words, if you knock out this RPFF gene in Burkholderia, you reduce virulence factor synthesis, we can actually measure virulence. I think they did it in zebrafish. We did it in the wax moth larvae uh, to see that it actually reduced virulence. And of course, this made it into an intraspecies signal rather than into an interkingdom signal. Now, but as I said, the fact that this RPFF gene is not in the same context in the Burkholderia genome raises the question about how it's sensed. And we addressed this question by screening. What we did was we found a, a, a gene that we knew was altered in the RPFF transcriptome profiling. It's cable E, CBLD. We made a, a, a in, in, and in conjunction with the Tolkien Nielsen lab, in, 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 now in Copenhagen, we made a lux fusion of this CBLD gene, which would then, in an RPFF background, this fusion would go, would be off. If you add DSF back or BDSF back, this gene comes back on again. You can measure the light. What you can do then is make mutations with transposable elements and look for transposons that make the, this system non-responsive to exogenous BDSF. 
And when we did this, we found the number of genes that were involved in this, or a number of genes that affected that. And one of these was a, was a sensor kinase, BCAM0227, a histidine sensor kinase, which is completely unrelated, or has an unrelated input domain to RPFC, the DSF sensor in xanthomonas. And to see how unrelated it is, here we have RPFC again, five transmembrane helices, or predicted to be five transmembrane helices. And this is BCAM0227, only two transmembrane helices and a large periplasmic loop. Again, what we can do is these kind of domain swapping experiments, I don't want to go through the details of this, these domain swapping experiments show that this bit of the molecule here is actually responsive to DSF when we do it in the xanthomonas assay, making a chimeric protein with RPFC, it will recognize DSF. An important control, of course, is to show that if you put in the, sensor, the, the input domain of other sensor kinases, they don't actually work. So we have done those type of controls. Okay, so then we get to the point then that other bacteria produce DSF-related molecules. And again, around about the same time, this, there was this paper that came out uh, um, um, from Binghamton showing that, that, that Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces a molecule called cis-desinoic acid. Now, people have actually looked for um, DSF signals in Pseudomonas with uh, the bioassay that we use for Xanthomonas, didn't detect anything. And when we've used this molecule, this purified molecule in our assay, we don't find anything either. So it just shows that this, there must be some form of specificity associated with RPFC perception. The other thing that's not known about this is exactly what genes are involved in making it, and also what genes or gene products are involved in perceiving it. But it does seem to have a role in biofilm kinetics and biofilm dynamics in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then another, more, even more recent report was of SDSF. Now, this is transdesinoic acid, and it was called SDF, SDSF because it was apparently related to DSF. But as you can see, it's got a trans configuration. Trans configurations do not work in our DSF bioassay. It does affect uh, the yeast hyphal transition in Candida albicans, uh, and I, I think that possibly they're calling it SDSF is a slightly, slightly misleading because it was shown by the Zhang lab that these versions, and we've also shown that, that these trans versions are not very active as DSF signals. The question is, is, is uh, does this represent another class of these molecules in which the, 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 the um, stereochemistry here is actually important? It nevertheless will work at physiologically relevant levels as an interkingdom signal, and that was published in 2010. Now, what I've told you so far gives the kind of impression that every one of these organisms produces one signal, BDSF, DSF, STSF, and so on and so forth. And again, uh, more work from the Zhang lab indicated that, in fact, that there, there are multiple DSF signals produced by many of these organisms. And here we can see the bacteria in, in this Burkholderia cepacea complex, and they, they analyzed a number of these. They produce BDSF, as Burkholderia sinocepatia does. They produce another uh, 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 molecule that's, that's a DSF family molecule with two double bonds in it, cis-cis-11-methyl-dodeca-2,5-dienoic acid, which they called CDSF, and you can imagine why, uh, because you don't want to keep saying this all the time. Okay, and then multivorans also produces DSF. So these bacteria in the Burkholderia complex produce a range of different molecules. And then when you look back at Xanthomonas aurisia and Campestris, these also produce these three molecules. So there seems to be, although we originally had only detected DSF and BDSF, these other molecules seem to be present. Okay, now, but the biological relevance of this isn't quite clear because if you swap RPF, uh, this is what they did in the Zhang lab, if you swap RPFF homologs between different Burkholderia species, you don't change the pattern of signals that are produced. It suggests that the pattern of signals you get is dependent on the substrates which are provided to RPFF. And similarly, the, in Xanthomonas aurisi, if you grow the organisms in different media, you get different ratios of CDSF, BDSF and DSF and also different ratios at different time points, even with the, obviously with the same RPFF gene, RPFF protein. So it suggests that the, that the pattern that you get, it depends on the growth conditions and is not determined by some specificity of the enzymes that are involved in making it. Or so basically, and in the, in the last uh, minutes here, so I started off talking about this, this, this uh, cis-DSF. I've, I've now told you that we've got a growing family of related 
bacterial signal molecules. And of course, this family uh, uh, are, are all down here. We have other members, uh, SDSF, which perhaps wouldn't necessarily be associated with this simply because it doesn't have this, the, the, this um, cis bond here. We have related molecules from other bacteria. One of them is this 3-hydroxypalmitic acid, methyl ester. That was a signal molecule from Rolstonia, uh, discovered, I think, by Tim Denny and uh, Mark Schell. And then, and, and also farnesoic acid, a signal molecule from Candida albicans. So these kind of fatty acid chains, sometimes with double bonds, sometimes with two double bonds, seem to be an important and emerging class of signal molecule. I've also tried to allude, I'm not going to talk about this in any detail, that these molecules are involved in interspecies signaling. I gave you some evidence that Stenotroph monas interacted with Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa by production of DSF. We've also, and it's, we've also shown that the, there's, there's obviously interaction between Burkholderia and Stenotroph monas involving BDSF and DSF. And also, and an, an established interactions already between Pseudomonas and Burkholderia involving homocene and lactones. Many of these signal molecules, DSF, BDSF, OXO, H, uh, C12, HSL, affect the yeast typhal transition in candida. So th these signals, uh, along with the homocene lactones, can be regarded as interkingdom inter inter -kingdom signals as well as interspecies signals. So where are we? And, and so this just brings us back to, as a summary. We started off with this, which was this uh, sensor kinase RPFC involved in recognizing DSF, and activating through phosphorylation RPFG, which is a, an HDGYP domain cyclic digene P phosphodesterase. The signals in the other, the, the, the systems in the other organisms are quite different. First of all, they're not directly related to cyclic digene P signaling because we note that in BCAM0227, we think that BCAM0228, uh, is, which is actually a DNA binding protein, is a regulator which is involved in transducing. Uh, the BDSF signal. We also see here that BDSF is well recognized by quite a different domain structure here than it is in RPFC and of course but, but even though the rest of the protein is uh, somewhat similar in domain structure. And here we have uh, PA1396 in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Again possibly an eavesdropping type of approach here where we don't have um, um, uh, a HPT domain, and we have, a, we have what we call an orphan, is that bad or good? An orphan HPT domain protein uh, down here. Um, um, oh, just, just trying to stir the pot there, Vittorio. Yeah, okay, uh, and, and, oh, and again, maybe associated with PA1397, which is a DNA binding protein. Take home messages, there's no one system that, that, that you can't translate what happens in xanthomonas to what happens in other organisms. The, 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 the signal transduction scheme in each of these is quite different. And as we'll see later on in the week, even within xanthomonas, there's a lot of variation in how this system can be used to regulate different uh, functions within the same organism. And that, of course, leads me to what we, well, that's what we know, but what we don't know is a larger amount. Okay. First of all, we don't really know what the enzymatic substrates or the mechanism of the RPFF DSF synthase family is. As I said at the beginning, it's got some homology to enal CoA hydratase, but as yet, no one's able to. We've been, I, I know that the labs in Singapore have been able to purify RPFF, but they've not been able to make it make a DSF molecule in the test tube. So we really don't know what the substrates actually are for this, en for this, for this enzyme. We, we, we want to try to identify. Um, sensing mechanisms. I mean, we don't know whether multiple sensing mechanisms exist in other organisms, in the same organism for DSF. And there's evidence again from the Steve Lindau's lab that perhaps in Xylella, there may be multiple systems involved in recognizing DSF. It doesn't even have to be recognized at the cell surface. It could go inside the cell and be converted to a CoA derivative to act as a co-inducer or co-repressor. We want to try to establish signal transduction pathways. Again, we've made some efforts with this in the Xanthomonas system, but as you can see in Burkholderia and in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we still are moving down from the sensor to try to find out what the regulatory pathways actually are. And they seem to be complicated, branched pathways from a single sensor regulating different functions. And of course, there's always this interest of trying to understand uh, the DSF family signals as inter-kingdom signals involved in fungi and, and, uh, and in interaction with fungi and high eucalypts, including plants and animals. And at the moment, I don't think anything's known about that at all. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop there uh, at my overview, and I'll, I'll take any questions. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs>